Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy the presentation and over to you, Joanne. Thanks, Sheila. Um, so my name is Joanne Jones. I live in Bethlehem. Um, and um, as Sheila mentioned, I'm an ACT trustee and I'm also a member of the Outreach Committee, which is the ACT Committee that plans um, these events. And I'd like to thank all of you for attending our talk tonight on feeding birds in winter. And as Sheila said, our speaker tonight is Dave Gavatsky, whom many of you may already know. Um, Dave's career was with the U.S. Forest Service, where he worked for over 30 years as a forester and a forest fire management officer. He is also the co-author of the book Forests for the People, the story of the Eastern National Forests, and has written numerous articles on forests as well as on White Mountain history. In addition, he's an active volunteer for several organizations has worked for many years to maintain the trails at Pondicherry National Wildlife Refuge in um, Whitefield and Jefferson. And he's an avid birder at Pondicherry and elsewhere. And so thank you, Dave, for spending time with us tonight. And I'll turn the program over to you now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Joanne. Thank you for your kind words. Welcome everyone. Um, you're amongst 59 million Americans that are reported to be um, interested in bird feeding and actively participating in this aspect of nature. So um, I'm looking forward to the presentation tonight. I'll, I'll give you some of my experiences and we'll uh, have a variety of topics here. And so um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, some of the topics I'll talk about when to start and end feeding. And I think I'll, I'll do that right now. Uh, really what New Hampshire Fish and Game recommends is December 1st to April 1st. And I'll do that with some clarification. This year I started on the 20th of November. Uh, the bears had pretty well, uh, uh, you know, turned in for the winter and we had several inches of snow on the ground. So I felt that was good. Now, April 1st is pretty much when a lot of the bears start to wake up from their uh, deep sleep. Um, if you do, And we do get snowstorms after that. We've had them in May. And so what I would recommend is don't leave your bird feeders out at night um, and don't leave bird food on the ground. You could, if you're going to be around the house, um, you know, go ahead and put the bird feeders out in, in the daytime. So, uh, but generally December 1st to April 1st is, is when you want to do it. I'll talk about the types of bird food, and um, it's what I call survival of the fattest. And fat is what birds are looking for in the winter time. And so we'll talk more about that. And then I'll um, introduce you to some of the bird species that we're currently seeing at the bird feeders, talk about some of the bird feeders, how to place them, and dealing with critters like squirrels, raccoons, and other wildlife. Um, talk a little bit about water and water opportunities. And then I have some learning opportunities that you might uh, be interested in participating in. Then if whatever questions or observations that you have on winter bird feeding, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll answer those right at the end. Uh, so the most common and most widely used and accepted bird seed that's out there is um, black oil sunflower seed. And if you only decide to go with one type of bird food, that is generally going to be uh, the one to go with black oil. Uh, I tend to, you know, I, I've been doing this for many, many years. And so I tend to have like a buffeteria with various kinds of food. And I, you know, I'm just interested in, in seeing what birds eat. So I'll talk about some of the other things. But black oil sunflower seed, has 40% fat, 16% protein. So that's what the birds are really going for. And chickadees and, and most birds will be able to crack that shell. Now, sometimes uh, like a, a year like this, we have a lot of evening gross beaks. Uh, yesterday, I counted 83 evening gross beaks coming to the feeder. Today, I had over 70. I didn't do a real close count, but I had a lot. Um, and so we sometimes go to what are called gray stripe sunflower seeds. And those are a little harder to get right now. Uh, some places still have them in stock. They have less fat, um, a little bit more, pro well, about the same amount of protein. But the advantage of the gray stripe is that evening gross beaks, there's twice the kernel, sunflower kernel that's in there. Um, and some of the other birds uh, that 
you may consider to be more of a pest, like Blue Jays, for instance, they don't tend to go for them. Um, uh, so, but I would say, you know, just go with the black oil. If you want to throw in some uh, striped sunflower seeds, you know, go right ahead. Um, another thing that's really popular, and particularly if you have like a patio or a deck outside and you don't want to get all of the husks of the sunflower shells on it, uh, you might want to consider going as sunflower hearts. Um, and those have a pretty high fat, fat content, 40% fat. You can get them either in chips or in sunflower hearts. And, and I typically go through about 200 pounds of sunflower hearts in a winter and two to 300 pounds of, of sunflower seeds. Um, either one is fine. The chips the chips tend to be a little bit more expensive because they've been broken in the process. Um, some people like to use finch mix and uh, it's a combination of Niger thistle and sunflower chips. Um, Niger thistle has about 36% fat. So it's another one of those high fat content things has a little bit more protein. Uh, the key thing about using Niger thistle, there's some birds that really like it and I'll talk about them is that it has to be fresh. It, it can't be stale. So uh, you want to get a fresh bag and, and same thing, you know, don't, don't buy sale food at the end of the um, bird feeding season and expect to hold it over the summer because it does go uh, and spoil. So you want to get the fresh stuff as it comes in. So on the finch mix, make sure you get a good mix. Avoid having reed canary grass in the mixes. And if you look at the ingredients and they have the ingredients on there. I would say just go for Niger uh, thistle and sunflower chips um, on that. Incidentally, Niger thistle uh, comes from Ethiopia and India. So uh, maybe a fact you didn't, didn't know. Uh, mealworms are really popular with some birds, bluebirds in particular, but chickadees love them. Pretty high fat content. They've been uh, dehydrated or freeze dried. And you can also buy mealworms with fruit and nuts. And they're, yeah, they're kind of like a crunchy French fry for the birds. And, and they, just, they just really, really love them. So the, the mix with the fruit and nuts pro provides a lot of uh, variety there. And robins will also eat this. So a number of the birds are, you know, insect eaters. And so they'll like that. You can actually buy five pound bags on Amazon for about $32 uh, because the uh, farmers feed them to chickens. Another type of seed um, that some people use, less so here in the North Country, is safflower seed. And that is really popular with cardinals and grosbeaks. And I essentially do the uh, what you see on the right side of your screen, the cardinal mix. I do that with, with the grosbeaks. The grosbeaks will eat that Squirrels will not eat safflower seed. It has a bitter flavor, um, but the grosbeaks uh, will eat it. Um, and, and some of the other birds that might be a, a problem, like starlings, if you have them, they, they won't eat that. So safflower seed, pretty high fat content. And again, remember survival of, of the fattest. Um, seed mixes, and you can go to a grocery store or almost any place and you'll see some seed mixes, but they're not all the same and you get what you pay for. Uh, blends of sunflower seeds, white millet and, and um, milo are, are the best. Uh, sometimes they come with a lot of red millet because it's fairly cheap and it's used as a filler. Sometimes you'll get corn in there, uh, cracked corn or actually even whole corn kernels. You know, if you want to attract blue jays and morning doves, potentially rough grouse, uh, potentially even pheasant, if they've been stocked in your area, you know, you might want to consider that. You can also get finely cracked corn if, if your objective is to go for uh, morning doves. They really like that. And I get, I get rough grouse here, uh, sometimes half a dozen rough grouse, and they love that cracked corn, um, finely cracked corn. So go for good quality seed mixes if you can. For peanuts, look at the fat content on peanuts, 49% fat and 26% protein. So uh, it's probably a reason that we have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches when we were kids is that they're really quite nutritious. Uh, chickadees, nuthatches, blue jays, and woodpeckers love it. And of course, the squirrels really love it too. 
Uh, but I want to caution you, don't buy, I know you can buy number 10 cans of salted peanuts from places like Job Lot that are really designed for people. You can get flavored um, honey crusted peanuts or dry roasted peanuts, but you know, those are processed peanuts. Those are not good for birds. Um, so I would just stick with the peanuts that have not been roasted, have not been processed, and are, are just salt free. Uh, some people like to give peanuts in the shell. You can buy, you know, a five pound bag for several dollars. Um, it's okay if you want to feed squirrels and blue jays, they love that and they'll run off with those uh, things and then open them. The only thing is, is that as you know, we get more rain in the wintertime than we get snow, and they have a tendency to mold when they get wet. So we don't want to uh, harm our, our birds or wildlife that we're doing. So I, I checked on current bird prices, uh, bird seed prices in Littleton today. I use Trackside Garden Supply, which is on Cottage Street. I like I like them. They're a local business. They've been around a long time. I like the owner, Don. Uh, and his prices, I think, are are better than what you can get in the box stores. You may have your own place that you go to, but I checked um, black oil sunflower seeds today. They, the price has gone up a little bit. They're 40 pounds for 35 bucks, or you can get a 50 pound bag for um, save a little bit of money. Uh, sunflower hearts are $70 for 50 pounds. And I know that sounds like a lot, but it's pure food as opposed to a 50 pound bag of um of just black oil sunflower seeds so trackside supply uh, on cottage street in littleton that's my go-to place for bird food now another place i i guess i can i can plug some of these places because they're local new hampshire businesses this one is duncraft they've been around since 1952 you may be familiar with them they're a concord business um and and they have a variety of bird feeders from multiple companies um mostly american made products and they have bird food too um so consider you know buying from a store in, in concord new hampshire and of course they have mail order um, opportunities too. So great catalog. Their online catalog is, is really good too. Um, you can go to uh, the grocery store. You can go to the co-op or um, the market in, in Franconia or uh, Shaw's and Littleton, and you can buy beef suet. Beef suet is 94% fat, and it's essentially beef kidney suet. Um, and that that works out really well. And, and I found out, I was I was reading about this uh, oh, a while back that people actually use suet um, for for themselves, for human use. And I said, ah, it's a little high in the fat, but for, you know, basting things and, and that, but um, the birds love it. The woodpeckers love it and that, and you can get, I'll show you some cages that you can put it in. Uh, just if it gets warm, it will turn rancid. So um, what we typically do, um, when it's warming up, particularly in March, you know, you get those days that are in the 40s and, and sunny, you might want to consider switching over to these suet blocks. And, and they do contain suet, um, but it's been rendered and it's, it's, it's fairly good. Now, here are the two choices. I've gone through just about every kind of suet block you can think of. The one that is that I find to be the most favorite of of all the birds is from Pine Tree Farms. And it's a peanut butter suet with a 40% fat content, 12% protein content. There's there's actually peanuts and peanut butter in there and it doesn't have a lot of fillers. Now, the second one is from uh, CNS Products and that is called Woodpecker Treat. They, they have several others too, but that has a 45% fat content, 10% protein. So those are the two most popular ones that I've seen. Now you can go to you know some stores and, and you'll find that 20% fat is the maximum that they have. They're full of corn, oatmeal, sunflower seeds, and you know really cheap fillers. So I, I would suggest uh, going with quality, um, I can tell you the peanut butter suet cakes from Pine Tree Farms about a two and a half dollars a block, and they'll go through one of those every week or so. Uh, they're about two dollars for the woodpecker treats from from CNS. So what are we seeing in our area this winter? We'll talk about some of these species, and of course, black-capped chickadees 
when we do the Christmas bird counts, it's always the number one bird that we have around here. But nuthatches and and woodpeckers and cardinals and goldfinches, and this is really the um, a good winter for some of the uh, birds from the far north that um, that come down. Um, black cap chickadees, they love black oil sunflower seeds. They love these suet blocks. This one is on a uh, woodpecker feeder. It's, it's actually will hold two blocks of, um, of suet and it's got a, a long tail here and it's really designed for pileated woodpeckers. Uh, but, you know, most birds will use it. I even have a brown creeper that is, is using it. Uh, so that's, that's one item. Uh, here's a seed block with, uh, with peanuts in it and sunflower seeds. The, the chickadees love this kind of a thing. Uh, you can see it's kind of bent on the bottom. I had a raccoon that lifted it up off of the hook and dropped it down and, and chewed on it and, and damaged it, but it, it's still working. Uh, sometimes you might even get what's called a boreal chickadee. And, and the difference is, is that um, it's a bird from the far north. Um, we, we get to see them in the White Mountains above 3000 feet in elevation or some of the lowland black spruce swamps. It has a brown cap instead of a black cap. And this one was uh, coming to a feeder about three years ago in Littleton, New Hampshire. And it was eating peanut butter that was pasted on um, some pine cones. And, and those are the things that you can actually uh, make yourself. Now, it's interesting. I don't know uh, what you're seeing at your feeders for blue jays, but blue jays are in very short supply. I typically, you know, based on my records, have between 20 to 25 blue jays coming to the feeders on a daily basis. This year, I have one, and even some days, I just don't see it. So blue jays are short-distance migrants, and it appears that they have been heading south, much further south for the winter. I mean, they're a gorgeous bird, but they tend to be a bully around the feeders um, and they tend to push away other birds. But, you know, if it was a rare species, that color blue with the white and the grays on it would, would be just spectacular. But the fact that it's so common and they're so pesky, um, well, we, we just don't appreciate it as much as we can. Just a side note, uh, we have one side of our house, we, we have a, a stain that we use on it. It's a colored stain and there's calcium in it. And these blue jays love to peck the house. I have to paint that side of the house every year. And I'm happy that they're not here this year because they're not feeding on the um, on the stain. It's a, it's a problem in New England because they can't get enough calcium. Here's a, two of our common woodpeckers. Um, uh, the one on the left here is a downy woodpecker. It's quite small going to one of the suet feeders. And there's a hairy on the right going to a peanut feeder. And the one thing about a downy woodpecker, and you may already know this, uh, some of you I know are expert birders, but you know, take a look at the size of that bill. It's, it's very, very small, very pointed, very diminutive bird. Um, and it has a, a white spotted outer tail feathers. And that's one of the key ways to tell along with the size of the bill. When you have two of them side by side, it's pretty easy to tell which one's the hairy and which one isn't. The hairy woodpecker on the, on the right has a long bill. It's almost the length of the head um, all the way back here. And the outer tail feathers here are just a solid black. Um, it uses its tail. It's a very stiff tail if you ever hear them flying. Uh, as a third leg to steady itself, um, but they they definitely love love suet. Some of you, that's that's the call, uh, may have red-bellied woodpeckers. There's a few of them around as far north as Pittsburgh and Arrow. It's really a southern species that it's been moving its range further north. Um, and if you're lucky, you will get one of these beautiful red-bellied woodpeckers that will be coming to the feeders. Uh, they love black oil sunflower seeds, sunflower hearts. Uh, they'll eat the mealworms I mentioned, uh, fruit if you have it out, um, and um, mealworms. And, and of course, they love suet. You know, this the pileated woodpecker, I mean, it sounds like some kind of strange monkey out in the jungle when it when you hear it, uh, they may come to the feeders. I've I've had them coming to suet feeders, uh, but more often I see them underneath 
the feeders and picking up uh, pieces of suet off off of the ground. Uh, of course, this is the northern cardinal, and uh, and again, cardinals have been even though they call it a northern bird, you know, it typically is, you see it further south. They've been expanding their range further north as the climate warms. Um, this is a male uh, perched on some sumac, uh, beautiful bird, loves to uh, feed on black oil sunflower seeds, but because of their color, for the male in particular, they tend to be very shy because hawks will readily identify with that color and go after them. So they often will come out right at dawn or dusk on what we call crepuscular light. So, so they're lo really looking for cover. And one way to provide cover is to recycle your, um, your Christmas tree. And so um, my wife and I, uh, you know, usually on New Year's, we take the Christmas tree out, take the ornaments off, leave the lights on, and we put it outside to enjoy for another, you know, four to six weeks. Um, it doesn't seem to turn brown until sometime in February. And even then we'll, we'll move it over by some of the feeders for them to, um, the birds to find cover. They, they really like that type of cover. Uh, American Robins, will you'll have them all winter. Um, they actually will feed on staghorn sumac. Um, we get, we'll be hearing that, you know, in, in just a matter of a couple of months, I think a lot of you will be ready for spring after this winter, even though it's been a mild winter. Um, so staghorn sumac, if, if you have some, or if you don't have some, they're really easy to plant. I mean, you can dig them up, plant them in the ground, and they will spread. Um, you can keep them trimmed, but um, I love staghorn sumac. It has a beautiful uh, color in the fall, and, and the berries are, are really nice too. And we get a subspecies of the American robin called the black-backed robin. It's maybe half an inch longer, but the back is all black. It's also called the maritime robin, and they tend to be a little hardier species than our American robins. And, um, and they'll come down and they'll be feeding on, on different things. So um, if feeding birds is important. And one way that I strongly recommend is, is that you actually plant um, plants and shrubs and, and trees for birds. If you only had one shrub to plant, I would recommend crab apples. And not all crab apples are the same. Um, if you're interested, contact me offline and I'll, I'll give you some recommendations on which ones. Um, because some of them um, are really large and the birds don't sometimes go for it. Some of them will flower early, really beautiful flowers, and they'll fruit early, which is not what we're really trying to achieve because there's plenty of food in the summertime in August and early September. What we want to have is these late bloomers and late fruiting uh, crab apples so that um, we're going to have birds like the bohemian waxwing and the pine grosbeak, they're going to be coming down from the far north. These birds erupt. It's not like a volcano eruption. It's spelled I-R-R-U-P-T-I-O-N. Uh, and they'll come down. They're, they're frugivores. They're basically looking for fruit. I mean, it can be a whole apple or it can be these uh, crab apples, which are um, very, very popular. Um, we're starting to see, well, there's quite a few pine gross peaks around. I was driving over to um, St. Johnsbury the other day, and I took Route 2 from Lancaster, and there were pine gross peaks that were on the edge of the road, and they were flying up, and and I was jamming the brakes on just so I wouldn't hit them. They're, they're, they're pretty big birds, but beautiful birds, and they're actually coming to feeders. Uh, this year, we had an incredible crop of white and black ash seeds, and so they came down early, and we had large numbers of um, pine grosbeaks out in the woods, and they're still finding ash seeds on trees, and the bohemian waxwings are around, but they come in these big flocks, sometimes up to 300 birds, and if you have, say, a half dozen crab apples, it may only last three or four days. So hopefully you'll only have 20 or 30 of these uh, beautiful bohemian wax wings coming in. So plant shrubs, plant crab apple would be number one. Uh, you can also plant the second choice, if you had a choice, would be uh, mountain ash, which is actually not in the ash family. It's in the rose family. That's another one. And 
and you can plant European mountain ash, even though it's not native. They produce these wonderful orange berries every year, and the bohemians and the pine grosbeaks and other birds like blue jays and robins will just love it. Uh, you can buy you can buy um, crab apples, and you can buy mountain ash and quite a few other species from the New Hampshire State Forest Nursery. Um, I think it's I think it's around. You can buy a hundred, for instance, for about sixty bucks, or they're about a dollar a piece if you're just going to get ten or so. So um, you know, give it a thought. Uh, they have an online catalog. It's called New Hampshire State Forest Nursery. Um, you know, they're not they're not big. They're seedlings, maybe two years old, but they grow fast and they'll start producing fruit at, in about the fourth or fifth year. And it's a it's a fun way to invite birds. Uh, American goldfinch, uh, another species that we're starting to see at feeders. I've got about 15 of them. That's a bright one in the summertime. This is what they look like now. Um, they love niger thistle, black oil, sunflower seeds, and if they can get it, sunflower hearts. Um, I, I've never seen them eat suet, but um, who knows. But this year, this is the year of evening grosbeaks. Uh, we have so many of them. I have a friend who has uh, over 150 of them coming to feeders, and, and they have really erupted uh, further south, uh, largely because of the spruce budworm outbreak in Quebec and the Maritime provinces. Um, they, there's a lot of spruce budworm, and so they eat during the summertime the larvae of the spruce budworm to help control that population. So they're producing large families, and we get the benefit uh, in the wintertime because they're coming down. I mean, some people call them grocery beaks because they do eat so much food. I go through probably five pounds of sunflower seeds a day with, with these guys, but I'm, I'm okay. I'm fine. I, I love feeding them. Uh, one hit the window the other day and I quickly rushed out and I, I grabbed it. And that's it takes about 30 seconds and a bird will just freeze to death outside. So if you can get to a bird that's hit the window and it's just stunned, you know, pick them up carefully, put them in your hand. I take them inside. This guy took like 30 minutes to, to really, um, you know, get back in good shape uh, because it was stunned. But, you know, I let him out and he flew away. So, you know, it was a, it was another save. Um, so I took this a couple days ago on January 16th, it was snowing out and, and there were just, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 gross beaks. The, uh, females are, are lighter colored. The, the, the males are just, uh, just gorgeous. So it's the bird of the year for us this winter. And the population, by the way, has declined 92% in the last 30 years. So I'm pretty happy seeing this. I'm on a, a evening gross beak working team, uh, which includes um, scientists from North America and people like myself. I've been a silviculturist, so I have an idea in forest management. So I've been working with this group, discussing what the problems are, why the numbers have, have dropped so dramatically. Um, but uh, gorgeous bird, I hope you're getting them at your feeders. I mentioned pine gross beaks are now starting to come to feeders, uh, mixing in with the uh, with the evening gross beaks. Uh, this bill was, by the way, featured on the $1,000 Canadian bill. So I know some of you might have some Canadian money in your wallet. So go ahead and check. If you have a $1,000 bill, let me know. Uh, just kidding on that. Um, so this is, this is what the, you're gonna hear in the woods. Um, as you're walking through and particularly around these white ash stands and and they may not be very vocal but if you look up you'll see these chunky birds sitting in the trees um, on the trail upon the cherry i've been seeing them in because there's seeds on the trail and they've been actually down um, right on the trail now just starting to show up are what are called pine siskins a friend has 75 of them today the highest number and they seem to be just a little bit further north from us now but uh, last winter, we had them all over, and, and this is um, niger thistle uh, and some finch feed in here, and you can just see how many are on there, and they just come in in large numbers. So they have small bills, so they typically go for sunflower hearts and, and thistle if you can get it. Same feeder, um, red poles. 
common red pole, hoary red pole. I mean, they can come in large numbers, large flocks. And, and I was buying 50 pound bags of Niger thistle just to feed them. A uh, very attractive bird, and and again, the they're called a red pole because the top of the head here is called a pole. Um, it's an old term uh, for birds, so that's where they get their names. They're they're again visitors from the far north, and they erupt. Um, I've seen them only as far south as Groveton, uh, and they've been hanging out in birch trees because the birch trees have catkins, and they, they typically feed on that. They also feed on alder catkins, so uh, we may still see them. It's just January, so we may see them in, in February. I, I hope so. Um, when they start coming down, they, they'll come down in, in pretty good numbers. If they get a chance and you feed them these sunflower hearts, they um, they won't turn them down. They just love that. That's from last year. We have not seen a lot of purple finches uh, this winter. It's our New Hampshire state bird. Uh, we had a lot more this summer, uh, both male and females. Uh, for instance, at Pond the Cherry and many other places out in the woods, you'd hear the purple finches, beautiful, beautiful song. Uh, but I haven't had any at the feeders since early December. I do have tree sparrows um, in the center of this. It's a hanging tray feeder and they'll come to that. Uh, but typically tree sparrows are gonna be feeding on the ground. I've got seven, seven tree sparrows. And, and again, they typically show up in the morning. They've, they've you know spent the night perched in trees, they're hungry. It's been a cold night, and so that's when they typically come and, uh, and are out there. Beautiful bird, um, nice nice song, um, and I generally don't see them in the middle of the day. Uh, not This is a summer picture of a dark-eyed junco, and that's the trill that they make that you can hear in the background. Uh, dark-eyed juncos are, I'm not seeing very many. I might get one at the feeder every now and then. And a part of it is because we just don't have a lot of snow. We may have more tonight. Uh, so they're able to find some natural food. One indicator on how to tell a junco, if you're going down the road, you'll see this white outer tail feather. And, uh, and that shows up when they start flying. They just explode off the, off the roadside. Um, many of you have white-breasted nuthatches come into your feeders. They love peanuts. They love suet, uh, sunflower hearts. Uh, mealworms. Uh, so I hope you're getting some of these. These are, you know, just a just a very attractive bird. And of course, our red-breasted nuthatch uh, tends to be more of a conifer specialist. But you may have red-breasted nuthatches come into the feeder too. That typical yank yank call that it makes. Um, got a half a dozen of these uh, birds come in the feeders. There's a place I go birding at Moose Bog in, um, in Vermont um, in the Nulhegan area. Uh, and, and the nuthatches will actually come down, land on your hat, land on your shoulder. They're looking for food. Someone's habituated the birds out there. And of course, I have peanuts that, that help them. Um, you may not see this bird very well. It's a cryptically colored bird, very tiny bird, and a, uh, a long curved bill. It's a brown creeper. And I find them under the suet feeders and they're picking up uh, little pieces of suet um, and a uh, gorgeous bird. I, I actually love that coloration. It's camouflages very, very well. Um, really neat bird. So let's talk a little bit about water needs for birds. Um, I have a heated bird bath. Uh, yeah, I know it sounds like a spa here, uh, but I what I do, and I, I don't keep it plugged in all night because you know you're just wasting electricity even though we have we have solar here uh i plug it in during the day and i add fresh water every morning um i bought the one from ally precision industries in minnesota um and and they like it and they, they actually sell a special cord uh, that connects and and i put it in the outside deck and all kinds of birds are coming there they don't take baths in the winter time uh, but they do drink from there. And even the squirrels will come up and they'll put their paws up there and we'll be drinking water. Very, very cute. So uh, heated bird baths are a great idea. So you may want to consider that. Uh, you know, birds do, will take snow and they'll melt it in their mouths and, and do that. 
Um, I recommend if, if you have a peanut feeder to put a dome over it, you can see the one on the left here, we had some freezing rain and, and birds just aren't going to be able to get at those peanuts very well if, if they're covered in ice. So they get used to that dome. The other thing is the squirrels don't jump on it, um, which is always a good thing. Here's another one. Uh, you know, they'll, the squirrel will come down, it'll just slide off and 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 not get on it but the entrance for the peanuts is is at the bottom here so woodpeckers can tend to go here this particular feeder is made i think in north carolina it's made by brome industries lifetime warranty on it of course you pay a little bit more for it uh let's talk a little bit about our friends our squirrels and and other wildlife and, and critters the red squirrels and gray squirrels. And we also have flying squirrels. You'd be amazed how many flying squirrels are probably visiting your feeders at night. I don't consider them a problem. Um, I consider the red squirrel to be a, a problem because the birds are out in the daytime um, and, and they're going to basically be sitting on your feeders and, and preventing other birds from coming in. So, um, it's 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 a game to try to keep them off of the feeders. And so what I suggest is is predator guards. I use um, a pole system, typically a metal pole. I think I got this at, at Job Lot up in uh, Northumberland. And you can buy these shields. Um, here's one. Here's one on the right side. They call these torpedoes. And the squirrel will try to go up through here, but it can't get up through here. And they're perfect. Raccoons can't get up there. Squirrels can't get up. But the flying squirrels at night, they'll come on down. Uh, there was uh, two years ago, I went out at night. It was after April 1st. And I said, you got to take your feeders. And I knew the bears potentially could be out. And I went to reach to get the feeder. I only had a couple of them out because it was particularly cold. And something said, you better look here. And there were two flying squirrels that were on the tray feeding and it's all right we'll give you another hour so i went out with a headlamp the next time to make sure i wasn't gonna uh get bitten by a fl northern flying squirrel uh, another thing if you have trees and you hang um suet or peanut feeders or bird feeders from the branches this is a uh, white birch our, our state tree i i buy stovepipe um, you know, I, I measure the diameter, of course, of the tree, and I get it, you know, maybe an inch or two larger. It's like $4 for a stovepipe. And then I buy hose clamps, and I actually get a 12-foot length of hose clamp and, and some of the um, devices. And so I cut them to size, and then I just put them around the trees. And then in the springtime, I will... Um, basically unscrew it and take it off the tree but raccoons and squirrels cannot climb up the tree so that's a good thing squirrels may be able to jump you know from another tree but uh, that's what i use you may want to consider um, you know using that kind of a predator shield or you may have your own idea uh, we also have visitors we have short and long-tailed weasels or what we call ermine and they're going to be feeding on um, red squirrels they're going to be feeding on mice, and I've actually feed, seen them feeding on uh, that beef kidney suet. Uh, and, you know, you can't complain about a little white weasel like this that weighs about six ounces feeding on that. They need to get about a third of their body weight every day because they're really quite active. And uh, the fact they're eating mice and a few red squirrels, well, you know, God bless them. I'm glad they're doing it and, and that. And um, there's a good chance you uh, may have uh, your local uh, bobcat come and visit the feeders because all of this activity, they can hear the birds uh, calling and singing, and they can see the activity. They know there's squirrels around. And so we get bobcats coming in uh, to our feeders every winter. This is taken through uh, our kitchen window looking at one of these uh, kitties out here and of course this i had some suet up in our apple tree our crab apple tree and of course you can see the bobcat got the suet and it's quite proud of itself it's walking off uh in the distance here so i ended up having to put suet blocks in there i i don't you know recommend feeding you know wildlife other than you know squirrels and birds in the winter time so i didn't want to habituate it where it would get used to 
uh, humans. So, uh, but I do love to see the bobcats, and if they're eating squirrels, that's that's fine. Uh, red occasionally gray fox will come in. Um, it's a snowbank by our feeders, and again, it's probably looking for for mice. Um, potentially, it, it could go for a bird, but it's it's unlikely it's going to be able to uh, to gather that. So they're they're big mousers. Uh, bears. Uh, if if you are feeding, if you start too early, let's say you're starting in you know October first, and bears start coming, they get habituated to that. They may not turn in for the winter until you know January or so. And so um, it's best that you go ahead and not feed until you know the bears have have denned up for the winter usually December 1st, sometimes earlier, depending on the weather, and and take them in by by April 1st, because this, this senior April 3rd, I get so many reports of people having all of their feeders knocked down um, by bears. This was at, actually at Bretton Woods. Uh, you also might get some other birds that are coming there that are considered to be predators of um, uh, of your birds and, and, and or squirrels and mice. And we get barred owl, on the right every year and and the northern hawk owl we've had once uh many years ago uh really neat bird and we get the northern shrike uh every year so let's look at some of the resources uh that you might want to consider one of these is the winter finch forecast i'm actually part of that team with um tyler whore out of uh, ontario i cover vermont and new hampshire i'm i have to uh, measure the uh, fruit and nut crop on uh, 10 species of trees and shrubs. I have these sample plots in the, in the two states that I go to, and there's about 35 other people in different parts of North America that send in their sightings, and Tyler puts it together. He's a professional biologist, and we put out a forecast. It comes out mid-September. It's, it's anxiously awaited. You can go online and look up the winter finch forecast for uh, for this year. Coming up um, in just a couple of weeks, New Hampshire Audubon has the backyard winter bird count and survey. And the following week, the National Audubon Society has the uh, backyard bird count. So give some thought to uh, getting involved in that. You know, it only takes 30, 45 minutes of coverage and it's, it's really neat. I'm almost finished here. Um, so I wanted to mention two other uh, opportunities for learning, and, and I'm a big fan of uh, learning more about your hobbies or sports or other activities to learn as much as you can um, and, and taking a course. Uh, University of New Hampshire Extension has a, a course coming up uh, again this year, starting on April 1st. Uh, it's a 12-week online course on bird identification, ecology, and habitats. And there's, I think there's about 60 or 65 field trips that are involved in that. No, you, you can't do all 65, but you can do, um, you know, you can do a dozen if you want. Um, I'm actually taking it uh, this year, and I think I've signed up for three or four. There's a bunch of local courses in Northern Grafton and Coas County, uh, and there's certainly others in the mid-state region. Uh, check it out. It's online. It's called the Introduction to Bird Identification, Ecology, and Habitats course. Great instructors. Phil Brown is one of them. Uh, Matt Tarr from Extension is another. $45 um, is the cost. It covers materials, and it's a fun course to learn more about it. $75 if you need to get certification. They'll send you a diploma. Uh, another course uh, that is available is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in New York, and it's a course on feeder birds. Um, it's it's a really interesting one, and these people know how to train you on how to identify feeder birds. They have you know multiple courses too, but the neat thing is it really gets into bird behavior at the feeders. Um, so give that a thought. I think it is $49.95. Somebody said that if you order it soon, you will get um, a second course um, 
on on birds. So you're getting two courses for the price of one. Again, it's online. You have as long as you want to get it done, and you can get a get a diploma for your resume if if you want. Um, check it out from the Cornell Lab of uh, Ornithology. And with that, I wish you happy birding and. Uh, and this is my totem bird, the Canada Jay. Uh, I share a lot of the characteristics of that bird, but uh, with that, I'll stop sharing and and we'll see if there's any questions here from anyone. Thanks so much, Dave. That was fabulous. Great. Uh, we have one one question in the chat, which is from Jane, and she said, "I'd like to hear more um, to hear thoughts about avian flu." Yeah, avian flu this year has been a, a real problem, particularly in um, chickens and, and waterfall. Um, and it's it's fairly contagious in large numbers, uh, particularly in, in areas with water. And so I, I know they the egg supply, for instance, has been really hard to fill. There's about 40 million chickens that they had to destroy that um, were exposed to avian flu. It's also a problem with um, ducks and geese uh, and that. I haven't heard too much about um, what we call you know, songbirds or, or land birds affecting that. Um, and I haven't seen any, uh, you know, concentrations of dead birds. Uh, you know, we had the, uh, we had some other problems with, with crows uh, that were, you know, insect borne uh, diseases that were affecting them. And you'd find dead crows out in the woods and blue jays and that. But uh, I haven't seen a problem with um, with our land birds. But at the same time, what we want to do is we want to keep our bird feeders clean. And I use soap and water about once a week and, and just scrub it out. Um, I take them in. If I know it's going to be raining, I I take in the bird feeders because I don't want the seeds to get moldy. Um, some people use bleach on them and that's fine too. And I just make sure I dry everything out. End of the year, I certainly go through a you know major clean. I, I have 17 bird feeders. I probably shouldn't admit that, but uh, because somebody might think that I've gone a little bit uh, off the deep end with birds. All right. Another question. That was a good one. All right, we have another one from Loretta that says, any suggestions to discourage pigeons from overtaking feeders? Yeah, pigeons, uh, particularly if you live close to a town, um, they, can, they can be a problem. Um, so it's the variety of feeders and there's, um, there's some feeders that have a cage around them and they'll let chickadees and goldfinches and small birds in. They keep the squirrels out. They'll keep the morning doves and pigeons out. Um, so that's one thing. And there's other feeders that have a hopper and they have, um, you can control the weight on it. And I had, actually had to change that and I had to put um, uh, a higher setting because the evening gross beaks were using it. Uh, that works real well too. Um, if you have corn in the seed, they'll find out about it and they'll invite all of their friends to come over. And turkeys, for instance, wild turkeys will will tend to feed on that. And and because turkeys are so big and they're often in flocks, uh, you know, they can spread disease. So you you want to be careful, careful with that too. So um, you know, I kind of like pigeons. I I don't get them ever here, but I do get like 15 morning doves, and they're kind of neat to need to see. So they typically like that mixed seed. You could try putting it, if, if you have a fairly good sized yard, maybe in an area that is away from the other bird feeders, and they'll typically go, go to that. Good question. Great. And we have another question from uh, Rosalind, who asks if you can talk about the best places to put your feeders in the yard. Yeah, the, well, of course, the first rule is you want to be able to see them from your windows. And you want to have them close enough to conifers. They they really like the 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 cover uh, that conifers provide. So you don't want to have them too close. But typically, six feet is about as far as a gray squirrel or a uh, red squirrel can jump. And certainly, the the uh, flying squirrels can go. They can glide much further. Um, so that's that's where I put mine. Um, I 
tr I, I only have one feeder that's close to the house. It's on our deck uh, because I, I want to keep them away from the windows uh, as much as possible. So there's no collision. So I like I like to put them near conifers and <clears throat> near cover where they can they can basically take off. And I have some solar panels that hang over um, our our garage. Um, and I, I hang probably four feeders from that and it's protection from the rain. And the birds seem to like that. They, they tend to flock to that too. Great, thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chats. Uh, I don't know if anybody um, is, wants to unmute themselves and ask a question. Or if everybody's busy adding things to their shopping carts. <laughs> yep. And, and <laughs> the other thing, is, if you do have questions, you can get a get a hold of Sheila or or mm -hmm. uh, Joanne Jones, and they have my email address, and they can forward the question. I'll I'll try to answer it. If you have photographs of birds you can't identify, I'll I'll try to do that or sound recordings, um, and and that would be good. We had a beautiful barred owl at our feeder this well in the trees looking at the feeder this morning oh, and this evening. Sure. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, the barred owls, it'd be pretty tough for them to catch a bird, but mm -hmm. they're certainly looking at those squirrels and certainly looking at the at the mice. So I have another question that just popped up, which okay. is what type of crab apple tree do you recommend for Franconia? Um, I would recommend the sergeants crab uh, which typically has a fairly small fruit it's about three eighths inches um, around it has beautiful flowers um, and it typically ripens to a beautiful red color in uh, in October so it's a, it's a later one um, and sergeants is one um, I might I think I have a a guide to crab apples and I think I can send that to you Sheila and maybe you can include that with the um, with the link. Yes, we can do that. <laughs> okay. I am not seeing any other questions. Well, uh, we're at about five of seven, so. All right. Oh, hang on, one more question. Oh, one more question, okay. Uh, are there any goldfinches in winter? Yes, um, you know, some winters I'll have 50 or 60 goldfinches right now i have 15 of them that is that's a high count it's how many i can see it at one time uh so there's there's a fair amount of goldfinches around uh you can hear them uh flying over um so yep they're here and we should be seeing pine siskins here in another couple of weeks i believe i know we forecasted for them this winter all right, not seeing any other questions, just some comments about the great presentation. Well, thank you, everyone. Dave, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us and your enthusiasm. Okay, thank it's you. And uh, it, was, it was good to see everyone and uh, we'll see you out on the trail. All right, thanks so much, Dave. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining us. Have a good night.